Right, so our second speaker of this session is uh, Gordon Dale from the Jacob Lab at Emory University School of Medicine. Um, and today he's going to talk to us uh, about some work they did clustering mutations in both mice and humans at the IGH locus, um, showing that it exhibited significant linkage consistent with template mutagenesis. That I will hand it over to Gordon. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm just sharing my screen at the moment. Uh, one second. <clears throat> Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay. Yes, but you're not full screen. All right. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Gordon Dale. Um, I work in the Jacob Lab at Emory University, um, and I study somatic heart mutation and templated mutagenesis, also known as gene conversion. So I'll be talking to you about that today. And uh, what I hope to impart is some uh, pretty exciting work and kind of give some updates if anyone's heard any of my talks before. Um, so with that, I'll kind of get started. Um, so I've broken this talk up into two different parts. Uh, in the first part, I'm going to talk about some previously published work on micromology gene conversion. And I have it asterisk because I kind of want to give an update to everyone about that. Um, but then I also want to go into the more exciting um, work that's unpublished at this moment, uh, looking at genome-wide gene conversion. Um, so kind of just to get into it, I'm sure everyone knows this, but uh, just want to recap with somatic hypermutation. As I'm sure you all know, this is a critical mechanism for generating an antigen-specific high affinity antibody during uh, humoral immune response. And if you look at mechanisms by which uh, somatic heart mutation can occur, there are basically two broad classes. Um, you can look at untemplated mutations, which are mutations that don't have a, um, that aren't uh, related to an existing sequence in the genome. And then there's templated mutations. Um, which are those that are brought about by gene conversion in which uh, you are copying a related sequence that's pre-exists in the organism's DNA. Um, so to kind of give an overview of what that looks like, I have two germline sequences here. Um, and on the bottom germline two, every dash represents an identity to the sequence above it. So what you're looking at in germline two are just the differences between uh, germline one and germline two. So if we were to look at a normal somatic hypermutation scenario where there's uh, untemplated mutations, what we'd see are um, mutations that don't seem related to either uh, germline one or germline two. Um, and that's what we would call untemplated. When we look at something that's templated, what we see is something kind of like this, where you see the differences between the two germlines are the mutations um, that we observe in the mutated sequence. And so this would be a, like a gene conversion tract and we'd call this templated. Um, so I just kind of want to walk you through the story here that we, we worked on. Um, originally when we were doing this work, uh, we were sequencing mouse germinal center B cells. And if we plot uh, linkage disequilibrium between uh, different mutations, and that's just a measure of whether two uh, mutations co-occur in the same sequence, what we saw was increasing linkage disequilibrium represented on the y-axis at uh, distances represented on the x-axis that were less than 100. And this would affect would increase the closer mutations got together. So we thought this was kind of weird and we were uh, kind of chasing this down. And what we uh, ended up doing is looking at linkage disequilibrium in um, rabbits that, that were known to do gene conversion. And we see a similar pattern. So we thought that perhaps um, gene conversion was uh, acting on uh, mouse germinal center B cells in the same way it does in rabbit germinal centers. Um, so just kind of going through the story really quickly, um, what we ended up finding um, was about 60 to 80% of clusters of mutations that were about base, base pairs long that had two or more mutations seemed to have a template in the IGHV gene segments. And we saw that in uh, murine germinal center cells. We also saw that in human plasmoblasts. Um, but we wanted to expand our, our analysis. So we looked at also exogenous sequences, such as layer one, which is unrelated to any IGHV gene uh, uh, segment. Um, we also looked at, in mice, these two passenger transgenes, GPT and beta globin, um, that were uh, at a passenger IGH locus and were non-selected. Um, and what we saw was something similar. 
And uh, just kind of really briefly how we went through this, we were looking at base substitution patterns and using a Monte Carlo approach where we essentially asked the question, are the identities of uh, certain mutations critical for this uh, high propensity of mutations that we were seeing? Um, so what we ended up concluding, and which I'll comment on in a second, was the following. So we were looking um, at these microhomology uh, regions and finding uh, that mutations in, in these regions could be explained by uh, different uh, sets of templates in the IGHB uh, repertoire. Um, and we used a script known as PolyMoti Finder um, that we thought was a, a good approach for uh, an unbiased inferential analysis uh, and detection. Um, <clears throat> And then when we looked at both IGHV genes and the non-IG genes, it seemed as if they used the both, they both used the same templates to diversify. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, about 60 to 80% of these uh, mutations seem to come from germline motifs. So I just wanna kind of give an update on this um, for a recent paper that came out this year um, by the Madison Group, which was a really good paper and really thorough and critically analyzed uh, this, this approach we had. And uh, there are two big takeaways from this paper. Um, and I know I'm kind of summing it up really quickly, but the two things I wanted to talk about were that PolyMoti Finder uh, had a high false positive rate and that the statistical method we used uh, was sensitive for detection of differences between our hypothesis and the null, but it didn't describe the effect size. So in effect, if we had a small uh, effect size, but we sampled many times, we would end up with a large p-value. So at this point, when we saw this, we had to kind of take a step back and we had to like ask ourselves some critical questions on our approach. And, you know, as I'm sure everyone listening is wondering at the same time, like when we look at um, these sequences, is what we're seeing real? Um, and in order to kind of get at that question, I kind of want to uh, segue uh, to another study where we can pretty much uh, see the effects of a templating like process <clears throat> and kind of use that as a springboard to talk about the newer work that I've been working on. Um, so um, if uh, no one's familiar with this, uh, these are, uh, I'm gonna to talk to you a bit about these layer one antibodies. So the layer one antibodies are uh, human antibodies that um, have a templated insertion at the B, uh, D junction. And this uh, layer one antibody is a broadly neutralizing antibody to malarial antigens. Um, and the broadly neutralizing activity of these antibodies is directly related to the somatic hypermutation of the layer one segment itself. So we know that at least a templating event can happen. We also know that uh, in subsequent work from the Lanza Vecchi group that <clears throat> templated insertions happen at some frequency in the switch regions of humans. Um, so a templating process still seems to be possible. And um, when we were looking at this problem, we were interested in the somatic mutations occurring in the layer one sequence. So uh, here I'm showing you uh, kind of walking across the uh, layer one insert, kind of going from base pair zero to 670. And each bar is representing a mutation that was observed in that particular sequence and each red um, bar was representing the progenital gene conversion tracks that we looked at in the microhomology thing, which again, does have some uh, serious drawbacks. But what I wanna call attention to are these regions where highlighted in green uh, that have a lot of uh, somatic heart mutations and in our analysis didn't seem to come from any particular IGHB gene. So we were really curious about this and uh, you know, we wanted to kind of figure out, well, where, where is this coming from? What is this? Um, and so we kind of did what anyone who doesn't know what a sequence is does, and we ran it through BLAST. Um, and what we found is that if we do an alignment of the germline layer one sequence, the somatically mutated layer one sequence, and uh, our BLAST hit that resulted from this, um, we saw a pattern that kind of looked like gene conversion. But again, you know, we're searching the entire genome. It's a large space, and the chance of running into something that isn't uh, real is very high. In fact, when we look at the E value and the P value associated with this particular blast hit, uh, it was a one in 10 chance that this is, um, this would just come about by chance. So we asked the question next, how do we get at whether or not this is real? Um, and in order to do that, we developed a, a new script, uh, which I'm calling trace. 
Um, and what it does is essentially do a series of Monte Carlo experiments that are nested within each other. And what we're looking at is basically, do the identities of the mutations matter for the strength of the blastit that we observe? And do the relationship between the mutations in a certain motif of a, certain, of a given size, in our case, 38 base pairs, um, do those matter? And then lastly, do the positions in which the mutations occur in the sequence set overall matter to uh, the strength of these, uh, these blast hits? And so what we do is we run blast uh, hundreds of thousands of times, just essentially getting a feel for um, whether a certain blast hit um, is significant. Um, and so when we do this, um, we can ask the, the larger question, uh, you know, if these genome-wide templates can contribute to humoral immunity. So in order to do this, uh, we took uh, samples that, was, that were gathered in collaboration with the SANS lab. Um, so we had three healthy subjects and one SLE patient. And we looked at um, switch memory cell um, subsets. We sequenced these, um, these cells and we ran them through IMGT to assign uh, their germline uh, reference. And then we went through, ran our trace uh, script and we first asked the question, well, if these, uh, if these tracks are happening, if these inter-chromosomal gene conversion events are happening, what percent of mutations are these actually accounting for? And so when uh, we look at that across all the different IGHB genes between all the patients, um, what you're seeing is like uh, essentially a relatively small contribution, uh, somewhere between four to 10% on, uh, for most of these data sets. Um, and so each black bar here represents the average of each patient, uh, of the total patients, and uh, each dot represents an individual patient's um, set of sequences. So knowing that, we then turned our focus to, all right, now that we know there's a, a relatively small but uh, non-zero non amount of uh, potential mutations that are explained by this mechanism, where are they coming from? So here on the left, I have a circles plot, which essentially uh, shows on the circumference the entire genome. Um, and I've annotated chromosome 14 at the IGH locus so you can see where uh, these uh, events are going into and where they are coming from, which is everywhere else. Um, and on the right, I've broken this up by patient. So you can see kind of the spread. Um, and if you uh, take a look, uh, some things become pretty evident. So uh, chromosome 14 at the IGH locus seems to be predominantly where we see these larger tracks come from, which is what you would expect because the homology is there at the IGH locus if this is happening. What was also notable was we saw in chromosome 15 and chromosome 16 um, an enrichment of uh, donors from there. And in fact, when we, uh, when we looked at it, just kind of uh, intuitively, it seemed like there was some clustering that was happening um, at these regions. And I don't show you every patient's circles plot, but this showed up in many cases around the same area. So we next uh, took a look at these specific regions. So here I'm showing you chromosome 16. We're looking at about a 15 uh, to 20 uh, kilobase region. And in black bars uh, for each patient, I'm showing you a specific trace identified hit within uh, one of their antibodies. And what you can see is that between each patient, um, these trace hits are lining up. And not only are they lining up, um, they're lining up with proximity to one another um, within this uh, 20 kb region, um, but also, the areas which they are lined up on uh, tend to be either pseudogenes, uh, IGHB pseudogenes, or long uh, non-coding RNAs, uh, which is uh, in purple here. Um, and so we thought this was pretty odd um, because this, uh, this would be uh, pretty striking to have this happen over and over again. Um, so when we looked at chromosome 15, um, now we're looking at a 40 uh, KB region, um, we see a similar pattern. Again, seeing an, uh, a clustering pattern between different patients um, in certain regions that are undergoing uh, transcription, um, which you can see on the bottom by the human mRNA bar. Um, and that uh, tended to be IGHB pseudogenes or long non-coding RNAs. So 
Um, to kind of talk about the next bit, I just wanted to kind of talk about uh, chromosome territories and really the spatial organization of, of uh, different chromosomes in the nucleus. Um, and so if you were to look at a nucleus, what you'd find is that uh, the DNA isn't uh, randomly interspersed um, with, without relationship uh, to one another. And that each chromosome tends to occupy a space um, and those are known as territories. And so you can see in this image here, for example, chromosome 14 lives in one corner uh, of, the, of the nucleus, whereas chromosome 16 lives in yet another, and that these two wouldn't uh, necessarily interact. Um, so uh, we wanted to take a look at whether or not uh, the fact that these were clustering was indicative of perhaps the chromosomes 15 and 16 being located close to the IGH locus. Um, and in order to do that, um, we looked at high C data. And so high C data is nice because it allows us to visualize um, essentially the interactions that are occurring within the nucleus. Um, and so we leveraged, uh, leveraged that data that was from this paper uh, published in Immunity in 2016. And we essentially compared our trace predictions um, to a known high C contacts between the IGH locus and other uh, interchromosomal locations. Um, and then we compared that with a equal number of random genomic sites to say if, for example, the trace predictions were done at random. Um, and just to orient you to what the data will kind of look like, I, I have this, this, this diagram here. So you can think of a high C contact in this case being the bullseye on the left. And if our trace hits are good at predicting where the, um, the high C contacts are, um, they'd be clustered towards the center. Um, and on the graph on the right, you can see as we walk away from the center, um, our cumulative frequency increases, but um, the graph itself is shifted up and to the left. Now, if we were to examine uh, kind of a random distribution of trace hits, what well, we'd see something uh, like uh, on the left. Um, so you'd have the scattering pattern that when you look on the right and graph this as distance from the high C hit, which is the bullseye, you see the graph shifted down into the right. Um, and when you plot that, this is what it would look like. So with that in mind, um, I'll show you some of the data that we saw. So here I have four different uh, plots. Uh, we're looking at germinal center B high C data and naive B high C data and then the trace hits from patient 730, as well as a random assortment of trace hits or genomic locations um, in uh, cyan and in gray. And some things are uh, become apparent when you look at this data. And the primary point here is that uh, the germinal center, um, germinal center high C data as compared to the trace hits is the best at um, essentially lining up um, that is, our trace hits are predictive of where high C contact points are. That isn't uh, uh, essentially um, relegated only to the germinal center B cell uh, high C data. That also is true in the naive B uh, high C data as well. So this suggests that um, the trace hits um, uh, at chromosome 15 and 16 tended to be closer together um, to the IGH locus at baseline in naive B cells, but was enriched in the germinal center B cell data. Um, now, if you recall, I showed you before that a lot of these clustered areas were uh, non-coding RNAs and pseudogenes. So if we restrict our focus to that, because uh, that was the most significant clustering that we saw between different patients, um, what we see when we plot the same data, just again, focused on these pseudogenes and uh, the long non-coding RNAs is the following. So what you end up seeing in this graph is that there's a uh, enrichment of uh, high, high C hits at our trace uh, where our program predicts their hits um, in the germinal center B cell. And this, this uh, difference between the germinal center B cell and the naive B is greater. Um, so this suggests that at a resting state in a B cell, these uh, 15, chromosome 15 and 16 are associating with chromosome 14 at the IGH locus. But this uh, interaction is upregulated um, or at least brought close to, in close proximity um, during the germinal center reaction. So now that we've talked about uh, kind of uh, 
where these are happening in the genome. Uh, let's shift our focus again um, and kind of come back to the sequences themselves, the sequences that are undergoing mutation. And so in order to talk about this, I want to talk about uh, overlapping AID hotspots. So the canonical AID hotspot is WRC. Um, and it's possible to arrange uh, a sequence such that you have a WRC on the, uh, on the coding strand as well as on the reverse strand. And uh, what's interesting about this, if you look at it at the bottom here, if you have a deamination event on the top strand at the C and on the bottom strand at the C, both in the WRC motif, uh, and you have downstream processing, what you'll uh, eventually result in is a double strand break. And so we know that this, uh, this particular sequence is enriched in uh, class switch regions, and this is how you promote the double strand break permission needed for class switch recombination. Um, and we also know from a few other studies that these AID overlapping hotspots, uh, they tend to be located in CDRs uh, and they tend to affect the mutability of not just themselves, but the nucleotides around them. And that kind of makes sense based on what we know canonically about somatic heart mutation. What's also interesting though, is that we know that a double strand break is sufficient um, to generate a gene conversion event. So, uh, you know, question remains, um, if these trace hits are showing uh, gene conversion-like events, is this occurring at these sites of AID overlapping hotspots um, where a double strand break can happen and a gene conversion event could presumably happen as well? And so here I'm just showing you uh, a particular data set from IGHB 5-51 from a, a particular patient, um, just denoting where uh, CDRs are in, uh, highlighted in red. Um, and now if we go back and overlay that with our trace hits shown below, um, what you see is that these trace hits line up primarily. And these, at least in this patient, uh, they seem to be centered around CDR1. Now, um, when you look below that on the, the bottom most graph here at the bottom, I'm showing the location of these overlapping AID hotspots. And at least in this case, you can see that the, uh, there's a nice association between the location of the traces where we see them, as well as where uh, these AID overlapping hotspots are. Now, I've color coded the IGHV um, hotspots and the trace clusters of mutations identified by our program, uh, just to kind of give you a feel of, of, of what is going where. Um, but now, um, with this in mind, if we take a look at another patient, one of the four that we, um, we had examined, we see a different pattern. Now, in this particular patient, we were seeing a high frequency of framework three mutations. Uh, but again, seemingly clustered around uh, a set of overlapping AID hotspots. Um, and then we saw a smaller section um, in framework one, again, kind of in the vicinity of these uh, overlapping hotspots. And if I show you two more patients, the pattern does differ, but you get the sense, at least from all these patients, that there is a relative dearth of uh, these trace hits at CDR2, which in this case has no uh, overlapping AID hotspots nearby. So this seems to suggest that these were happening in relation to these, um, in relation to these potential breakpoints. And so, uh, what we wanted to look at next is just if we go to a non-IG sequence, do we see a similar pattern? Is this span um, past an IGHV uh, gene undergoing mutation? And so if we turn our attention to layer one, uh, here I'm showing a similar graph, just looking at um, a particularly som uh, somatic heart mutation um, profile of a layer one insert uh, that was found in the by the lines of Vecchia group. And when we run trace over this, we see we do see some trace hits, um, and those trace hits tended to be located around these overlapping hotspots. So, so we see this in one patient, in another, in yet another, and lastly, the fourth one we examined. Um, and so with all that said, um, the conclusions we reached from, from this work so far is that we see these intra and interchromosomal gene conversion uh, tracks, and we think they contribute to somatic, uh, hyper, hyper, somatically hypermutated genes. Um, we see that both IGHV genes and the IGHV pseudogenes uh, can contribute mutations 
Um, based on uh, data that I'm not showing here, it seems like donor choice is homology mediated, which makes sense, um, at least in the literature of gene conversion. Um, we know from the high C data that the donor templates are uh, physically closer to the IGH locus, especially during the germinal center reaction uh, as compared to the naive B. Um, and we look at uh, donor templates, um, they tend to cluster between individuals uh, and data I haven't shown here, they're uh, located in proximity to open chromatin. Um, and they uh, are also tend to be from genes that are preferentially upregulated during the germinal center reaction. Um, and when we did some statistics on whether or not these tracks do uh, center around these overlapping anti hotspots, what we see is a trend for these tracks to be um, in proximity to rather than far away from these overlapping hotspots. Um, and so, you know, this is uh, kind of a great computational start um, since we're, a lot, we're essentially using mutations to predict uh, B cell characteristics. Um, but kind of the, the goal, like holy grail of, of looking at this would be to capture this um, kind of event as it's happening, or at least be able to provide some experimental evidence to support what we're working with. Um, and so I'm just detailing a few different experiments that we've got in the works that I'll be working on over the next year, um, where we're generating a, a transgenic mouse model, which is similar to the NPLO uh, model, uh, in which you have a knocked in IGHB172 that's responsive to the NP Hapton. Um, and what we did in this is we removed the overlapping hotspots uh, by mutating or rather changing um, uh, pieces of the sequence that would result in a silent mutation. Um, so the amino acids, the same uh, amino acid sequence, the same should respond to the MP system, but the mutation profile should be a bit different. And we wanted to see if we see a reduction in trace hits there. The other thing we're working on is seeing if we can uh, capture the DNA heteroduplex that's supposedly uh, occurring if these uh, interchromosomal contacts are happening, if you're templating off of these things. Um, we want to be able to capture that sequence and show that that's happening. And then we're also pursuing a microscopy approach to look for recruitment of these homologous repair factors to the IGH locus, um, following a double strand break to see that these repair factors are in proximity and lend uh, itself to the story of a templated event. Um, and so with that, I'd like to acknowledge the organizers here. Uh, it's been great to be able to present this work. Um, I have to, uh, for sure have to thank my, my lab. Um, they've been a huge support and have helped me a lot, as well as our collaborators, especially notably the SANS lab who have uh, been very helpful in providing sequences to us and providing um, uh, very useful discussions on whether or not this is potentially happening, uh, as well as everybody else who, is, who have worked on this project and our funding sources as well. With that, I can take any questions. All right, thank you for the very interesting talk, Gordon. Um, we do have a few questions. So the first one is from Lindsay. Um, how do you distinguish gene conversion from undiscovered uh, germline genes or alleles? Um, so that's a good question. You wouldn't be able to, at least during with the approach that we're doing. It is possible that you're having um, undiscovered germline alleles. But what we're uh, leveraging here is not only looking at uh, Ig genes, um, but also looking at um, other sequence uh, things like uh, the uh, layer one insert, um, which we know the sequence of um, and we know uh, characteristics about. So we're trying to link this past the IGHV genes to kind of uh, support this. But to directly answer the question, we wouldn't be able to know uh, a priori. I think there's a related question from Corey um, of whether or not there is any bias in the donor sequences within the IGH locus like in the IGH V5-51 example? Yeah. Is the IGH donor always the same? Um, a, a bias in, in, in what way? I, uh, it's kind of, uh, it's a little difficult to, to, uh, to kind of postulate on the potential biases here. We try to remove bias uh, as best as we can um, by uh, going through multiple different uh, levels of simulation and in fact, when we do our trace hits, we generate uh, fake 
data sets um, and run trace over that and compare our original hits to the set of fake data that we make and run the exact same script over um, and kind of extract our, our hits from there. Um, but it uh, would be great to know uh, specifically what bias you, you had in mind. Sadly, that was not a main answer question. Uh, we have a question from George. Um, he's asking, RAD51 and BRCA2 mice would presumably have less homology mediated strand inversion. Could template mediated IGH mutagenesis be less in those mice? Yeah, um, so that, that would be the prediction. Um, Currently, um, we haven't worked on those systems, um, but we are chasing down RAD52 and BRCA, BRCA12, um, looking at whether or not these are involved in that pathway that you would generate a gene conversion product from. Uh, follow up on Corey's question, you clarified, when you see an IGHV donor contribute to a given gene, uh, given conversion event, is it often the same gene? <laughs> that the conversion event is coming from a, an IGHV gene? In the, yeah, in the same donor, I believe. Yeah. Um, so we see within the IGHV genes, we see a pretty high frequency of IGHV donation. Um, that's kind of what we saw when we looked uh, across all the different donors and all the different chromosomes. We saw most of the donors were coming from chromosome 14 at the IGH locus. It, uh, rather than some other place at, on chromosome 14. Um, so it would seem that this is happening primarily because those sequences are both one homologous and two uh, located either just upstream of the rearrangement. Um, so they're tethered by proximity um, and they have the homology necessary. Thank you. Um, in the interest of time, we'll, I think, have to take the rest of the questions offline.